Which camera do you want me to look at? So, hey, wait, are we talking about whether technology is good or bad? I think that's too simplistic because the argument is we know technology can be good or bad. Are we too worried about technology? Or like, how worried should you be? Or what's the right amount of worry? Something like that. The 21st century. This is what it was supposed to look like. According to the Jetsons, at least. Flying cars, weekends in space, and robots that would carry out domestic chores. Here we are in the 2020s and we're expecting it to be like Blade Runner. And you know, where are the flying cars? Actually, there are some flying cars. I'm not sure I'd want to go in them just yet, but they are here. But I think if you know someone visited today, the 2020s from the fairly recent past, they'd be amazed at what we have. Like airplanes that travel to the other side of the world in a matter of hours. In the past, people took months or years to get to some parts of the world and had a pretty good chance of dying on the way. Rather than wait weeks for a letter, people can communicate with one another at the click of a button, a savior in the COVID lockdown era. Almost every day, she waits here by the mailbox. Technology is getting better, but what about our relationship with it? Well, I think we have a love-hate relationship with technology. We like the good parts, and we like them so much that it becomes part of our lives, and then we kind of stop noticing it. I mean, the, the classic side of a mature technology is that you only notice it when it stops working. And the pandemic has really made us realize how important it is for technology to work because we're using it now more than ever before. Before the pandemic, Americans consumed digital media for six hours, 49 minutes each day. In 2020, that went up by over an hour. During lockdown, the internet was a lifeline for businesses and enabled social connections. Technological advances also facilitated rapid vaccine development. However, recent years have shown how quickly optimism about technology can turn to pessimism. In 2010, 2011, the Arab Spring was happening and people were, were like talking about the power of social media to spread democracy and everyone was very, very optimistic about it. And of course, that's not what happened. The same technology that galvanized people and gave the world cute cat videos also disseminated ISIS beheadings that spread extremism and fake news that undermined confidence in vaccines. It's not just that we're worried about the consequences of it, it's also this really dramatic contrast between what we thought we were going to get and what we actually got. It's easy to make starry-eyed predictions about the wonders of technology, but in reality, unforeseen consequences often dampen our view of it. Look back at history and it's clear that humanity has swung between being optimistic and pessimistic about technology. Seeing the repeated pattern is key. Let's take a journey back in time. The Victorian era was a period of rapid technological transition, when many world-changing innovations first appeared. They had to get used to not having things that could go faster than horses to having things like steam trains and telegraphs, you could suddenly send messages from, from point to point, you know, faster than you could send an object, which had not been possible for the whole of human history. So you know, the world changed over just a period of a few decades, really beyond recognition. And of course, same thing's happening again now with computer technology. So seeing how people reacted then can help us understand how we're reacting now. Some people were not all that thrilled. The Luddites became a symbol of the resistance against industrialization. They rebelled against the introduction of machinery in the textile industry. But were they right? To be fair to the Luddites, they weren't saying technology is bad. What they were saying was, we are worried that the introduction of this technology is going to change the balance of power between uh, the owners of, of capital and the workers. And they were absolutely right. So actually, they had a point. The deeply unpopular Luddite movement was met with huge resistance. Factory owners took to shooting protesters. The army, too, was brought in. At one point, more British soldiers were fighting the Luddites than against Napoleon in the Iberian Peninsula. In the end, the Luddites were crushed into the pages of history. The Industrial Revolution was the greatest wealth creation event in history. It's very dramatic, and you've seen as countries around the world have industrialized, they've become much richer. But at the same time, it did you know, change the balance between capital and labor. It did mean that people who were alive in the 1820s got a bad deal. Um, in the long run, everything turned out better, but people had to live in the short run. It was a brutal time of change that brought about net benefits. Between 1760 and 1901 in Britain, life expectancy rose from 34 to 50 years of age, a nearly 50% increase. And adult literacy went up by 27% between 1760 and 1850. 
Then in the 1900s came another technological revolution, the horseless carriage, otherwise known as the automobile. In the 1890s, there was this big problem in fast-growing cities like London and New York that um, there was just horse poo piling up everywhere. The automobile shows up and everyone goes, oh, thank goodness, we'll switch to this. And there were all these predictions made about how the automobile is going to get rid of pollution, it's going to get rid of congestion, it's going to be much quieter, and there were going to be fewer accidents. And so people were really optimistic. And of course, we now know those predictions turned out not to be true. There's no horse poo, but there's carbon dioxide coming out of them instead. There's lots of noise and there's lots of congestion and there are still lots of accidents. Can my machine talk to your machine? Thanks, Mary. Here we go. By the 1970s, technology was in every home, making life more comfortable. The future was looking bright. Do you have it in green? Certainly. Here it is. But the Cold War was dominating world politics, and with it, the prospects of nuclear annihilation. You may fly when ready. Concern about technology was once again on the rise. People were worried about technology, and they were worried about several technologies at the same time. 1973 dramatized U.S. dependence on foreign oil. The world was going to run out of oil. They were worried about overpopulation and, you know, was, was there going to be enough food to feed everyone? It was very much a, a familiar sounding litany of technology is running faster than we can cope. But by the 90s, the tune was very different. This Ameritech ad sums it up. Do you have a cellular phone? Why, yes, I do. Oh, so do I. <laughs> so you've got this pendulum swing from the 70s to the 90s, and suddenly everyone's really optimistic. At the end of the 90s, you get the dot-com boom, where like the internet's gonna fix everything, it's gonna get rid of poverty and lead to world peace. People actually believed that, because they thought that people would organize themselves into sort of online tribes. And there was a, a guru at MIT who said, our children are not going to know what nationalism is. This utopian view of an online global community has been replaced by tech doom-mongering. At The Economist, we've come up with a word to describe the sort of backlash against technology and against technology giants, and we call it the tech-lash. So how can the world get over its techno-pessimism, or tech-lash, and move forward in a way that's cautious but not fearful, adventurous but measured? The pandemic has reminded us of the upside of modern tech, much of which we had taken for granted. The rapid development of vaccines proves how science and technology can change the world for the better. So I wonder whether that might make some people feel a bit more optimistic about technology again. At the same time, however, social media platforms have been used to spread misinformation about the vaccines. And there has been an uptick in cybercrime and ransomware attacks. Even criminals, it turns out, can work from home. All of which is a reminder of the need to tread carefully. The pessimism and the tech lash are good things in the sense that we're having that debate and we're going to move forward constructively. And if we, if we learn the lessons of history, then maybe the pendulum won't swing quite so far next time because we won't have had quite so many problems next time around. What we don't want is uh, overdoing the, the pessimism and just saying, oh, this is all terrible. There's an inconvenient truth. The solution to tech-related problems often involves more and better tech. If you look at what's happening now with the climate crisis, for example, we're really just kind of finally being faced with the bill for what we've been doing for the last 200 years, which is the Industrial Revolution. And now we've actually got to pay the bill. And how are we going to pay it? With more technology. Solar panels, electric cars, geoengineering are all possible technological responses to humanity's greatest threat, climate change. So perhaps there's a better way of thinking about technology. We need to recognize that technology has no agency, but humans have agency. And it's, you know, whether a technology is used for good purposes or bad purposes is down to the, the humans who use it. A hammer can be used to build things or destroy them. Advanced technology is no different. Part of the problem is that innovation moves quickly, often faster than regulators and rule makers can keep up. Certainly the regulation of technology, it does need to be very nimble, like the technology itself you're never going to get the rules right first time. So we're starting to see with some technologies the sort of sandbox approach. And this is where regulators say, we don't know what the right rules are going to be, and we know that we don't know. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to let you try doing this new thing. But we're going to be looking over your shoulder all the time. And at any point we can say, stop, we think this is having a, a bad consequence. 
people fear technology because its effects are often unknown. So mass perceptions can easily swing between bright and bleak. These swings between optimism and pessimism towards technology are nothing new. By recognizing this historical pattern, we may be able to ensure we don't swing too far in either direction in the future. We need new ideas to fix big problems like climate change. And if you imagine a world that looks just the same as it is now with all of the problems that it has, and you imagine another world where there's more innovation, well, I know which one I'd like to live in. I'm Tom Standage, Deputy Editor at The Economist. To read more about our changing relationship with technology, click the link. Thanks for watching.